Alright, today is Thursday, July 7th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. It's more of a macro discussion slash political chaos. So let's not waste any more time. And here it is, in focus tonight. Down goes Boris Johnson. Bye bye, Boris. You know, a couple of months ago, I produced a video in this channel with the title of The Inflation Crisis is Turning into Global Political Chaos. In that episode, I argued that the inflation problem that we're having globally will lead to an economic crisis, and this economic crisis will become a political one, which will cost a lot of political leaders their positions. And it started with Imran Khan in Pakistan. There are a lot of theories on why he went down, yet at the end of the day, he would have never went down absent of the economic crisis in that country, which stems from the global inflation phenomenon. And the question I presented back then is, who's next? Is it going to be Macron? Is it going to be Schultz? Is it going to be Biden? Well, we now have the answer, and the answer is Boris Johnson. Today, the British Prime Minister announced his resignation after a storm of scandals. And of course, the commentators are going to attribute the demise of Boris Johnson to the party gate, to his own personal scandals. But at the end of the day, political leaders don't go down because of scandals. There is one condition that enables these politicians to stay in power or be removed from power, and that is the economy, stupid. Case in point, here in the United States, despite all the scandals, Bill Clinton survived, and the reason is we had a good economy back in the 1990s. Likewise, Trump survived, and the reason is we had a strong economy under Trump. Now, if the economy in Britain was doing pretty good, Boris Johnson would have survived all of these scandals. But again, the man falls down as a victim of inflation and also as a victim of his own doing. Not the doing of partying and all of that, but the doing of selling out to the World Economic Forum's agenda. And today, the World Economic Forum lost one of their stooges in Britain, but rest assured, they're going to replace him with another one. And in this episode, I want to talk about both issues. The issue of the economic crisis that led to the demise of Boris Johnson, but also addressing the misguided global agenda by the World Economic Forum, which is costing a lot of politicians their own jobs. We start with the economic crisis in Britain. And I made a video about it, by the way. You can check that out. But let's add more color to why Boris Johnson went down. The Conservative Party could have covered for him if the economy was doing good. But the economy is a disaster in Britain. In other words, Boris Johnson was a sinking ship. He was a dead horse. You cannot bet on a dead horse. And therefore, his own party became emboldened to abandon him. Why would they do that? The reason is the economic crisis stemming from inflation. Look, for example, at the gloom, the mood for Britons. Matter of fact, the British population has never been more pessimistic in more than half a century than they are right now. Almost 50% of the population is now pessimistic about the economy. They have no confidence at all about the British economy. Why would they say that? The answer is the British economy is at a breaking point. It is falling apart. It is collapsing. Why? Because inflation is out of control. The latest reading in British inflation showed 9.1% increase year over year. This is a rate that is exceeding the United States rate of inflation. Not only that, but also surpassing the inflation rate in the eurozone. When we look at the misery index for the UK, it is shooting up higher rapidly to the point where it exceeded the US misery index. And this is happening because inflation is surging higher. And when inflation moves higher, the standard of living moves down. In this case, British wages have not kept up with this inflation. Matter of fact, in real terms, British wages are actually down more than 3% when you factor in inflation. That is below Germany's rate, below Canada, Australia, South Korea, US, Poland, Japan, France. The British population is facing worse purchasing power and standard of living than any of these countries. Matter of fact, real disposable income for households in Britain is collapsing rapidly in the fastest rate since 1956. And you wonder why the population is not happy? But rest assured, while the British population suffers from a demise in wages in real terms and the fastest decline in disposable income since 1956, the delusional madman leading the Bank of England, Governor Bailey, blames 
all of these problems on greedy workers asking for better wages. According to Bailey, your wages that are already lagging the rate of inflation are the problem causing all of this economic misery. Not the fact that energy prices went higher, not the fact that food prices went higher, not the fact that housing prices went higher, to the point where housing is not affordable for the majority of the British population. Take a look at this chart. In orange, you got household disposable income. In white, you have the nominal home price. Look at the gap and the difference between home prices and households disposable income in Britain. It is worse than France, worse than the United States, worse than Germany, Italy, Japan. It is only second to Canada, but Canada has certain problems, which is foreign buyers scooping up all of these homes, and that is being fixed right now. And we're seeing home prices in Canada moving down. But regardless, the gap is so wide in the UK between households, disposable income, and the average home price. But according to Governor Bailey, you need to lower your wages even more, even though wages in the UK are lagging most industrial nations. Even before the pandemic, UK wages were below 30% the wages in the United States. And we know that wages in the United States have not been living to the rate of inflation. So if it is bad here, it's even worse in the United Kingdom. UK wages are lagging that of Germany, the United States, and Canada. But besides the cost of living crisis in Britain, this economy is also suffering from lack of investment, lack of trade, lack of expansion. It has a huge amount of deficit, and that deficit relies on more and more foreign investment. Well, guess what's going on here? The UK has been funding its deficit using a mountain of debt from foreign buyers. Now, when we have interest rates moving higher globally, what do you think will happen to countries like Britain that are drowning in debt? Well, it could be manageable if the economy has a decent output, if the economy is expanding. But this is not the case in the UK. The British economy not only suffers from a budget deficit, but also from a growth deficit. While the growth in services in the UK economy has been improving year after year for decades, primary income, the growth in goods, are deteriorating rapidly. That pace of contraction for the good side of the economy, for primary income in the economy, is dwarfing the rate of growth of services in the British economy. Likewise, when we look at the net international investment position, also known as the NIIP, which basically represents the balance sheet of the country. Assets versus liabilities. If you have more assets than liabilities overseas, you're doing good. If you have more liabilities than assets, you're not doing pretty good. Well, the UK economy happens to be the second to last when it comes to NIIP, but there is a catch. The United States always have a negative NIIP, at least in recent history. And the reason is we have the reserve currency of the world. A lot of folks buy our bonds, and therefore we have more liabilities than assets. It's a different story for the UK. They shouldn't have more liabilities than assets. They should have more assets overseas than liabilities. But this is yet another illustration of how indebted the British economy and how weak it is. You see, as an economy, you can run, but you can't hide. When you have an economy such as the United Kingdom, which has been relying on foreign debt for a long, long time, and running budget deficit after budget deficit after budget deficit for years, the chicken have to come home to roost at some point. And unfortunately for the British economy, we are at this point. Why? Because inflation is out of whack globally, and central banks have no other choice but to increase interest rates dramatically, which cause the cost of servicing that debt to also increase dramatically. Now, can the UK afford to service that debt on a higher interest rate? The answer is not even close. Why? Where will the increase in revenues come from? Well, the short answer is more taxes, but that will cause the British population to be even more frustrated with the government. But is there any other choice when you have an economy that has been relying on foreign debt and hasn't been investing in major economies for years? As you can see from this chart, UK companies invest less than their peers in other major economies. And the downside to all of that is you got an economy in the British economy that is deprived from any foreign sources of revenue, at least when you compare it to other major economies. What does that mean? If you got that option of foreign sources of revenues, perhaps from stronger currencies when you pin it to the British pound, then it doesn't matter if interest rates move higher by half a point, a point, or two. The exchange rate could factor in for that. But the British economy doesn't even have that option, which could have come handy, by the way, because you got the British pound collapsing. So that exchange rate could have benefited the British economy had they invested in other economies. And the woes for the British economy doesn't just come from the lack of investment with the world, but also the lack of trade with the rest of the world. Look at the trade intensity index, for example. In light blue, we have the G7 average, excluding the UK, 
in white, we have the UK's reading. G7 economies managed to recover the loss in global trade volume since the drop of the pandemic. On the other hand, the British economy has a long way to go to recover the loss in global trade volume since the pandemic. Some would attribute all of this, the woes of the British economy, to Brexit. But in reality, the British economy could have done just fine with or without Brexit. The problem here is the mismanagement, the political chaos, year after year after year after Brexit. They never really got it together. They never really got the British economy on track again, and therefore it has a lot of ground to make up. And unfortunately for the British economy, the woes don't stop here. With the lack of trade and the lack of investment with foreign countries, UK companies cannot even invest in their own countries, let alone to invest in foreign countries and trade with other economies. Why? Because the borrowing cost is increasing dramatically, and it has been increasing for a while. You add to that the increase in interest rates globally, and it's going to become even harder and harder for British companies to borrow and invest and expand domestically let alone overseas. Even though perhaps the collapse of the British pound presents an opportunity that British companies should start exporting more to take advantage of this opportunity. But it is a double-edged sword. On paper, it is good for exports, but yet again, the British economy has not been exporting for a long time, at least when you compare it to other major economies. So unfortunately for the British economy, it is at the receiving end of the sharper edge of that sword. A lower British pound that is collapsing is not good for the British economy. Because when you have budget deficits for years and you owe all of these foreign investors a lot of money, you better hope that your currency is strong enough. Because what is the point of lending the British government, let's say, a billion pounds right now, and then fast forward five years from now, the pound goes down in value. You might get paid back, but now the pounds that you have are worth less than they were three years ago. That makes investment in the British economy unattractive, number one. Number two, a lower pound right now, given the fact that the UK economy is not exporting as it used to before, has actually a negative impact on the economy because it produces more more and more inflation. For example, if the UK, let's say, imports food from overseas and the British pound continues to go down, the purchasing power by British households to buy that food or any other import is now diminished. But perhaps we have good news today regarding the British pound, and that good news is Boris Johnson resigning. Take a look. So now we have more of a sense of what's going on with the politics, but what about the economics. Well, here, there's a couple of things to look at. First of all, how do people view the UK uh, as an investment? Now, you can get a sense of that by looking at what's going on in currency markets. Remember during Brexit, how it was kind of going around up and down, depending on what was going on with that roller coaster. Well, here, the funny thing is, it was moderately stable in the last few days. Really weak, the pound, right now, against most other currencies. But it didn't seem to be moving until we got that news uh, that Boris Johnson was going to resign. When that news broke, just look at what happened to sterling against the dollar. It shot up, and now it is a fair bit stronger than it was before. So there's a bit of kind of st stability premium there. People relieved that we know a little bit more about what's going to happen now. But of course, the big question is, what are they going to do about economic policy? What can they do? And one of the big things they want to address is this. Both the Chancellor, the new Chancellor, and indeed Boris Johnson have talked a lot about the tax burden and the fact that it is getting up to the highest level that we've seen since the 1940s. That's the rate at which we pay tax, basically, as a percentage of GDP. And look at how high that's going up. But here's the issue. They want to cut that, but for some people, the pressure might be in the other direction. The Office of Budget Responsibility, they're the people, the government's kind of official forecasters, they produced this bit of analysis just now, looking at the change in long-term deficit as a result of things happening recently. So basically, the higher these bars are, the more the deficit's going to go up. You can see the fiscal position, actually, that's improved a bit recently, but look over to the other side. So demography's a bit worse, so fewer people being born, so less people to, to pay taxes. Net zero, the cost of net zero means that fewer taxes are coming in, petrol taxes. So while we have the British pound recovering, at least for now. The problem is this lunacy that he is pointing out right now. The net zero, that refers to net zero emissions. In other words, to comply with the green cult in the EU and the World Economic Forum, the British economy has to endure even more pain. The question is, how can you make up for that? And the answer is simple, increasing taxes even more. So the tax burden will continue to move higher and higher and higher in the British population. Uh, and then you've got social care uh, and other factors as well. And you stack all of that up, 
and you're talking about quite a lot of extra costs. In fact, about £37 billion worth. If you wanted to get net debt, so the total national debt, down to the levels it was before the pandemic, you need to raise taxes by £37 billion, not cut them, and that is a lot. So that's one concern uh, for the Prime Minister, leaving aside whether he's actually able to pass any uh, of his legislation. But overshadowing everything, is this inflation. This shows you the inflation rate across the G7, so major economies around the world. Everyone thought that we had tamed it, that it was going to be low forever, and look at what happened. It has risen to the highest level that we've seen since the early 1980s, and the UK, that red line, is the highest of all. So it's that cost of living crisis that is going to remain the big economic challenge in the next few months. So it is no wonder why Boris Johnson went down. He's yet another victim of inflation and the economic crisis. But that's just one side of why Boris Johnson went down, the rise and fall of Boris Johnson. The other side is the fact that he became a complete tool, a stooge to the World Economic Forum, the green cult, the lunacy, which forces economies to work against their own interests by increasing the tax burden of the population, running budget deficits, and lowering GDP and the economic output of certain countries by killing the oil and gas industries, for example, to comply with the climate agenda. We also have the geopolitical agenda, which is also distracting leaders from serving their own populations. And that distraction is now costing them politically. We just talked about Joe Biden yesterday, talking about the liberal world order, the fact that the American population should endure more pain and buck up so it can help Ukraine. This is going to cost him politically. And the spoiler alert is Boris Johnson. And the World's Economic Forum makes no effort at all to hide their true agenda, which is to infiltrate and control government in the G7 and the developing world and steer those government into the agenda of the World Economic Forum, be it the climate or the geopolitical agenda. Take a look. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brez of uh, Argentina and so on, is that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, at a reception for, and I know that half of this cabinet, or even more half of uh, half of this cabinet, are for our actually young global leaders of the world economy. Right. Form. So instead of speaking about uh, U.S. versus um, uh, Europe or whatever it is. Um, we we should we should go into the direction of a coalition of countries based on the same values. If we do not achieve such a situation, um, those values will be eroded. Um, and so it's not only let's say hostile forces in the world who want to erode this this value. I think also internal forces like the impact of technology, of the media on democracy, are also eroding those forces. So we should, we should create again a coalition to defend the fundamental values on which our societies is, uh, are based. And Boris Johnson, unfortunately, got sucked into this so bad that he even forgot who he's working for, which is the British population. Your job, Mr. Johnson, is the prosperity of the British people. That's it. But this is what happens when you sell out to the World Economic Forum. You become distracted and you lose politically. And you can hear that distraction even in his resignation speech today. Take a look. In the last few months, leading the West in standing up to Putin's aggression in Ukraine. And let me say now to the people of Ukraine that I know that we in the UK will continue to back your fight for freedom for as long as it takes. And at the same time, in this country, we've been pushing forward a vast... Pro yeah, we'll support Ukraine as long as it takes. But at the same time, yeah, that this, uh, this country, yeah, we've got to talk about this country too. Dude, your job is this country. That's your number one job. Ukraine comes second, not first. And this is what happens when these leaders become distracted with the geopolitical agenda of the World Economic Forum and the rest. I mean, Boris Johnson lost it so bad with not only the climate agenda, the geopolitical agenda, but even the woke agenda. He went on TV and said that if Putin was a woman, he would have not have invaded Ukraine. Take a look. We need more women in positions of power. If Putin was a woman, which I, he obviously isn't, but uh, if he were, I really don't think he would have embarked on a crazy macho war of, of invasion 
uh, and violence in the way that he has. If, if you want a perfect example of toxic masculinity, it's, it would, it's what he's doing in, mm -hmm. in Ukraine. And of course, yet again, this was an easy win for Russia, easy win for Putin. Matter of fact, Putin is rejoicing the collapse of Boris Johnson, calling him a stupid clown. And maybe since Johnson is so woke and he wants more women in government, good, step aside and let's have a woman take your job. But that's Boris, folks. He's gone now. The question becomes, who's next? We know the other World Economic Forum stooges, Trudeau and Macron, already survived, at least for now. But then we have Schultz. He has a giant target on his back. And of course, Joey B. Joey B is going down sooner or later. Matter of fact, people say that the inflation crisis will cost Joey B not only the midterms, but perhaps... He won't even be able to run for a second term. And I say he won't even be able to finish this term. My bet is he's going to resign even before that. You watch. This inflation will take down leaders like you've never seen before. And their distractions with other agendas that are not serving their domestic agendas, that's going to cost them too. But again, is it going to be Schultz? Is it going to be Biden? Perhaps it's going to be somebody else. Not Schultz exactly, but very close to Germany. Take a look. Somewhere else that seems to be sliding into dictatorship is Holland, which may not entirely be a coincidence. The similarities between Canada and Holland are as startling as they are disturbing. Here's Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, leader of the laughably and ironically named People's Party for Freedom and Democracy. I'd like to highlight a, a World Economic Forum initiative in this regard, the World Economic uh, Forum Food uh, Innovation Hubs. And these hubs in Africa, in Asia, in South America and in Europe uh, will allow uh, businesses to connect regional stakeholders to skill innovations, because this is key, uh, skill innovations that can address food systems, challenge, food systems challenges. And here, uh, I'm particularly proud to announce that the Netherlands will host the Global Coordinating Secretariat of the World Economic Forum Food Innovation Hubs. The hubs are set out to transform food systems and land use, eh? I wonder what that means exactly. Well, your guess is as good as mine, but as I mentioned last night, currently the Dutch government is embarked upon insane efforts to slash greenhouse gases and reduce the amount of nitrogen ammonia in the soil by 30 to 70% by 2030, or even by up to 95% in some places, in order to meet green EU climate change targets that Holland has signed up to. And this means literally turfing people off their farms. I guess that's one way to transform land use and food systems, a eh, Rutter? Well, the Netherlands House of Representatives has released a statement which said, quote, the honest message is that not all farmers will continue in business. Those who do will have to farm differently. So here we have Prime Minister Rutte, who's also facing massive inflation in the country of Holland, also known as the Netherlands. On top of that, we got farmers now complaining and protesting all over the country because the Prime Minister is falling into the same trap of the World Economic Forum, working against the domestic agenda, pissing off his own people to please who? The globalist oligarchy, who has all of these leaders by the balls. So the lesson of the day here from the rise and fall of Boris Johnson is, if you're going to ignore your own population, if you're not going to make tackling inflation your number one priority and you sell out to the wish of the globalist oligarchy, well, you're going down. But with that, folks, before we get cancelled, let's move on to cover the stock market for you. And we start with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average in the green, scoring 346.87 points or a gain of 1.12%. The Nasdaq, also in the green, leading the pack with gains of 259.49 points or a gain of 2.28%. The S&P 500, also in the green, with 57.54 points or a gain of 1.5%. The sector's performances, all in the green, we're not going to shame any sector of the market today because all of them managed to close in the green. But look who's back! At number one, capturing the gold medal, energy. Number two for the silver, cyclicals. Number three for the bronze, technology. What about the advanced to decline ratios? They're improving dramatically. The breadth was actually good, very good. 
in the NYSE, 80% advancing versus 17% declining. The Nasdaq, 74% advancing versus 21% declining. Moving on to commodities, what's going on here? A rebound, big rebound today. Is it going to last? Is it not going to last? Well, that depends on the follow-up. Why? Because what we're seeing right now is a short covering rally. Are we going to see the dip buyers following up and buying? If that is the case, then what we got so far is a dip, a correction in commodities, and then we'll see all of these futures moving higher again. I doubt that this will happen. I think we already got peak commodities for now because the economy is transitioning from inflation to a recession, but we'll see. But for now, it was a good day for crude. The WTI above 100 once again. It gained about 3.5% today. The Brent also gained a little over 3.25% today. Gasoline, RBOP futures gaining about 5.25%. Heating oil rebounding higher with gains of over 7.5%. And then natural gas, massive rebound, scoring gains over 12.5% today alone. Let's talk about some energy news here, and your uh, favorite segment is coming. But before we do that, we have sad news. The Secretary General of OPEC, Mohamed Barkindo, passed away last night, or the night before that, I believe. Now, it'll be really interesting who's going to be the replacement. The assumption is the policy is not going to change either way. Now, shifting to gas prices at the pump in this country, you might have noticed that they're going down, at least for now. Our Bob futures went down. Crude oil futures went down big from the top. And therefore, we're seeing some relief at the pump. Now, the administration has been saying it is the Putin price hikes. It is the greedy oil companies. It is the greedy gas station owners. As prices were moving higher. Now that prices are going down, what are they saying? Here comes the BlackRock administration, Brian Deese, aka Mr. Liberal World Order, who came out today and said that the Biden administration policy of releasing oil from the strategic reserve, which has been happening, by the way, since last year, is single-handedly responsible for halting the increase in gas prices. Oh, how convenient, Mr. BlackRock. When prices go down, you want to take the credit. But when prices go higher, uh, th that's the Putin price hikes. That's the greedy oil companies. And I say, how come now that oil prices are going down, we're not thanking Putin? Since Putin is so powerful and he has so much control over oil prices and the gasoline prices at the pump, when they were going higher, then the assumption is he's also responsible for taking them down. So uh, thank you, Putin. You see how the stupidity is firing back now? How about the oil companies and the greedy gas station owners? How come all of a sudden they're greedy magic wands? The price gouging stopped working all of a sudden. Hmm, maybe because none of that was responsible of pushing prices higher at the pump. Maybe it was the lunacy of the Fed, the easy money policy that led to the increase in oil prices. And now that the Fed is tightening, oil prices are going down. But the BlackRock administration believes that we live in the 1950s where they can just spill out propaganda and take us for a bunch of village idiots who are going to believe whatever they say. And by the way, how is the uh, going on? Stikunatapoonbra. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that Germany and the European Union are in a world of trouble because they wanted to stick at the bone and they were dependent on U.S. natural gas supplies. Well, all of a sudden we have a problem in our export facilities. We can no longer export LNG to the European continent specifically Germany. So they have to rely on European sources of natural gas. Well, the only country really with power of increasing supplies and fueling the European continent is the country of Norway. But we also had a problem with one facility where workers decided to strike. That would have been a massive massive problem specifically for the German economy. But thankfully, the Norwegian government decided to halt the workers' strike. It was so bad that the Norwegian government had to interfere and all costs stop that strike. Because had the flow of natural gas stopped from Norway, it would have accounted for about 60% of exports, which could have shot European natural gas prices significantly higher, which could have dealt a significant blow to the German economy. We're also seeing not just Germany, the Netherlands, Holland, with the problems with the farmers and all of that, well, they're now scrambling to secure natural gas supplies before the winter season arrives. This is going to be a massive, massive problem in the fourth quarter of this year and the first quarter of next year. Because the strategy for now from the European Union is, 
and the United States for that matter, is secure as much natural gas supplies as you can right now. And then the recession happens in the fourth quarter, and the demand goes down anyways, but you got the cushion. You got a lot of supplies to weather the storm, and the demand is slowing down because of the recession. And therefore, we construct her to Putin, finally. In the meantime, here's how sticking it to Putin is going on. Russia is eyeing $22 billion in windfall tax revenue from Gazprom amid skyrocketing natural gas prices. Congratulations. Oh, and the whole uh, sticking it to Putin, brah, and the Russian economy is going to suffer? Well, JP Morgan now comes out and says the Russian economy is doing much better than expected, and it will only shrink by 3.5% this year despite Western sanctions. On the other hand, Morgan Stanley says the U.S. growth slowdown is worse than expected. Whoops. Talk about a pie in the face. To all of you in the comments who say, you don't understand, we have to keep doing this because we got to stick at the board, otherwise he's going to take Poland, he's going to take Germany, he's going to take everything. With what? With his little GDP that California... One state in America has a larger GDP than the entire country of Russia. But magically, Putin is so powerful... He's going to take the entire continent of Europe if we don't stop him right now. Well, how is that working? How is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results, not the definition of insanity? The approach is not working, folks. Period. Full stop. It is destroying our economies. It is causing political chaos. Look at what happened to Johnson. Meanwhile, Russia is making more money and their economy is doing a lot better than expected. The strategy is simply not working. We need a different, more viable, more mature strategy to tackle this challenge. But anyhow, back to the futures. What about softs? We're seeing a big rebound in lumber, now trading above 700 once again, and scoring gains of more than six and a three quarters of a percent today. We also have big gains for cotton, a rebound. Cotton has been absolutely decimated in the last few weeks, but it is rebounding higher and gaining about 4% today. Likewise, sugar futures closed with gains of a little over 3% today. On the other hand, we have muted to negative closings for cocoa, OJ, and coffee futures. Metals, we have muted action for gold and silver, but we have a rebound for platinum, copper, and palladium. Copper finally catching a rebound and scoring gains of about 4% today. Now, when we talk about copper, look, it is a leading indicator. If copper is rising, that is a good indicator that we're about to see an expansionary phase in the economy. But when copper crashes in this fashion, it is a telltale that we're about to see a massive contraction in the economy, also known as a recession. And I know a lot of you are steel bugs. You like steel, you buy Cleveland Cliffs, US Steel, etc. You gotta be careful here because metals are not gonna do good if we have a recession. And everybody was talking about China reopening and how that would stimulate the global metals trade, but it's not happening so far. It appears that the demand in the Chinese economy is not recovering as fast and as quick as anticipated. So yes, the steel output is down, but China has been hoarding for a little while, and now we have the opposite problem. We have an oversupply of steel. The stockpiles of steel in key firms, that reading is reaching the highest reading in more than a year. You see, the inflationary force of higher demand and lower supply is transitioning into the opposite problem, the recessionary force of higher supply and lower demand. Not because the supply all of a sudden caught up with the demand, but because the demand in certain corners of the economy suddenly disappeared. It disappeared because inflation is distracting spending from one corners to others in the economy. Number one. Number two, the hawkish rhetoric and action by central banks, chiefly the Federal Reserve. Back to the futures. What about meats? Muted across the board. No notable activity here. Grains, rebound day, short covering day. Everything's blasting higher. Soybeans, soybean meal, soybean oil, corn, wheat, rough rice, canola, all moving higher, except for oats. But even those futures, at least the bleeding stopped for now. What does that say? The short covering is here, but are we going to see a follow up by the dip buyers? Otherwise, after the short covering rally is done, we will see these commodities moving down again. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The volume is improving slightly for Apple and Tesla at least, but it remains below average and we're not seeing buying of calls at least not yet. We're actually seeing more buying of puts than calls, which is not a good sign, although at some point it becomes a contrarian indicator. Are we at that point yet? Not really. And the reason is we're not seeing such elevated reading like we saw back in 2020, for example, which marked the bottom. In the meantime, the hottest table in the casino today was Apple, 
Around 1.2 million contracts traded today. About 50% of those were calls. Uh, number two, Tesla, the souffle, around 1.2 million contracts. Exchanging hands today, about 54% of those were calls. Uh, number three, Amazon, at around 975,000 contracts. About 58% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. And we start with the ticker XME, the materials ETF. And in this case, we have somebody bidding for a rebound after the collapse in materials recently. They bought the 50 bucks calls for the expiration date, August 19th, with the expectations that the XME could rebound higher by more than 15% by then. They paid around 70 cents a piece to enter. The trade, all in all, spending around $550,000. What about the ticker KWEB, the KWEB? This is the Chinese technology ETF. It has been actually outperforming lately, but is it time to take some profits here in the rebound the short covering rally whatever it is perhaps this is at least according to this trade where somebody's buying the 30 bucks puts fading the rip in the k-web for the expiration date September 16th, with expectations that the K-Web could go down by more than 9% by then. They paid around 2 bucks a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $1.5 million. At the bottom of the table, what about the ticker CROX? You like Crocs? Well, somebody does because they bought the 65 calls for the expiration date, August 19th, with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 12% by then. They paid around 3.5 bucks a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $2 million. Now, CROX is under a short squeeze, I believe, and the chart is really interesting. So we're going to cover it in the chart analysis. But before we do that, here's the last one for the ticker BX Blackstone. I happen to be short the name, and I'm betting that these mother are going down and somebody agrees with me at least via put options they bought the 87 and a half puts for the expiration date august 19th with the expectations the bx could go down by more than 10 percent by then they paid around three bucks and 40 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around 1.7 million dollars moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here a sea of green but we're seeing the consistent winners the ultra defensives in utilities, in REITs, the defense contractors, the consumer staples kind of pulling back, at least today. Are we seeing a recovery, a short covering rally in energy, in materials, in banks, in chips? Yet the big caps continue to win. We're talking about Apple, we're talking about Google, we're talking about Microsoft, even Tesla. They've been outperformers throughout the week. So we have mixed signals here. On one hand, we cannot say that this is risk on because we haven't seen consistency in the high risk names such as RKK, for example. Yet we're seeing the big caps outperforming with certain degree of consistency, at least throughout the week so far. Yet that consistency is absent from, let's say, the cyclicals. Cyclicals were up on Tuesday. Then they went down big on Wednesday. Now they're rebounding higher again. You cannot really chase these kind of moves. Likewise, we have a rebound in energy based on short covering for now, taking profits. Can you really assume that this is going to be lasting? This is the dip to buy? What if we see energy moving down again tomorrow? Therefore, I say, folks, stick with the consistent themes. For now, we have utilities, we have REITs, we have defense contractors, we have big pharma, in addition to certain consumer staples. But besides that, we don't have any consistent themes, even with the big caps. Yes, the big caps have been up on Tuesday, Wednesday, and today. Can they be up again tomorrow? That's certainly possible. And now we have a theme. At least we have a certain level of consistency in the big caps. But once again, Show me the money. Show me the consistency. And for me to abandon the defense contractors, big pharma, utilities, REITs, consumer staples, I also got to see the money. I also got to see the money moving away from these names. The risk on in a more consistent theme before I say, okay, we got a risk on theme here, folks. Migrate the software to the RKKs of the world. But for now, we cannot say that for certain. Now, let's do some corporate news. And we start with the ticker Meta, M-E-T-A, also known as Facebook. Now, it turns out that even if you delete your data from Facebook, it doesn't really go away. And Facebook has the power to share your deleted data with the cops, with the FBI, with the CIA, with the aliens, with the Martians. They can do whatever they want. And there is nothing you can do about it and even when workers raised the alarm and said hey watch out here facebook is sharing your deleted data what do you think happened to the whistleblowers yep they get fired this is the tyranny of mark zucchini Berg, the big tech oligarchy they can get away with anything they want and speaking of meta facebook well somebody hacked the instagram account of disneyland and made a profane and racist posts that have since been taken down
I have no interest at all in finding out what these posts were. But the kids saw it, so the damage is done. And then we have Twitter, and Twitter is laying off a third of the talent team. And this is not the only bad news that we got from Twitter today, according to the exclusive article from the Wall Street Journal. It also appears right now that Reverend Elon is no deal. He's not buying Twitter. He made a lousy deal, and now he wants to pull out. And of course, the management in Twitter was hoping that Reverend Elon's pulling out skills would match his pulling out skills when he's banging his subordinate female workers. But speaking of layoffs, it wasn't just Twitter. GameStop made a nice pump and dump. Yesterday, they announced the stock split, and the stock shot up higher. Luckily for the morons who bought the pump based on a stock split, well, the company right after the bell announced laying off employees and the pies were served right away for the dip buyers who bought gme based on the stock split folks this was intentional this was planned it's a pump and dump somebody was holding call options somebody was holding shares they needed the pump they got the pump from the stock split and then they bought put options and here comes the dump right after the bell the predators are out there are you being careful or not of course not because you're gambling you're buying GameStop based on a stock split. Wow. And then we have Netflix, which is responding to the recent popularity of Johnny Depp after the trial. They're giving Johnny Depp a job. And I say, you know what? Watching this guy in the trial testifying, forget about making movies anymore. Just put a camera in front of Johnny Depp with him smoking weed and drinking a mega pint, talking about random stuff. Millions of people are going to watch. There you go. And then we have uh, news from Peloton. Peloton sweetens employee pay incentives as it fights to boost morale and stage a turnaround. Now, Peloton is in the trash. The stock crashed. The company lost billions of dollars. It is probably going to go bankrupt. Who would have thought IPOing a buy company is a great idea? But anyways, they fired thousands of employees, and now the remaining employees are afraid. They have no job security at all. So to sweeten pay incentives, Peloton is offering a free box of Kleenex to each employee in case they needed to cry. Moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. What do we see here? A sea of green with exception of the inverse indices. The rest all in the green. Growth, value, energy, technology, cyclicals, doesn't matter. International ETFs, all in the green, commodities, even uranium is up. Everything is up with exception of the inverse indices. And oh, by the way, we have muted action for what? The ultra defensives ETFs, the XLP for consumer staples, the XLU utilities, IYR in real estate, the XLV, which is for big pharma, healthcare. So it is kind of a risk on mode for now. Is it going to be sustainable or not? We have two hiccups to come. Number one, the non-farm payrolls coming out tomorrow. Number two, the CPI coming out next week. Now these two will make or break the stock market, but most importantly, they will give us a consistent theme to work with. In the meantime, we have to move on to the charts analysis. We start with SPY, the S&P 500 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? Well, the obvious is the chart completed the ABC pattern and then added a cherry on top because it exceeded the C leg target, which was 385, maybe a little more than that. But the SPY gave us all the way to the next resistance for around 389.82. So for now, that remains resistance, but we have support at 385. Now, the only problem with this chart is look at the momentum indicators, the RSI, the MACD, from a 30 minutes perspective. They're becoming overextended. What does that mean? The chart is becoming ripe for a pullback if any disappointment comes out from the employment report that we're about to get in the morning. Now, what does constitute a disappointment? We'll talk in the conclusion of the video. But here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. It finally got above 3,855. That becomes support for now. And the resistance, the chart is eyeing right now, is 3,960. Can it make it above that by the end of the week? Maybe it's too much asking, but it would be a major good sign for the bulls. For now, the volume is moving down. The momentum indicators remain positive, so the bulls, for now, remain in charge. The bears are hoping for a massive pullback, perhaps coming from a disappointment out of the jobs report in the morning. And the bears are hoping that the chart's going to pull back and lose 3855 by tomorrow. What about the Q's 30 minutes chart? It got really close to my number, 297 and a half. Not quite, but good enough. Now, when you look at the RSI, the MACD indicators, they're all becoming overextended. Once again, the chart is ripe for a pullback. The pullback will only happen if the employment report comes out disappointing. And again, disappointing doesn't mean losing jobs. 
or slow down in the pace of jobs creation. That actually could be a good news for the stock market. Again, we'll talk at the end of the video, but for now, the move was algorithmic in nature and it got a little overextended. Naturally, we should see a pullback. That doesn't mean the end of the bounce, the end of the rally, but it means we should see a pullback. The problem is if this pullback comes out hand in hand with a disappointment from a fundamental source, such as the employment report, we could see that pullback being exaggerated and it could pull the chart all the way down to 285 and a retest to that support. But what if the report comes out as good news for the stock market? Can we see an extension of gains in this chart? Possible, but really hard to see. Why? The overextension in technical indicators is one reason, but the other is we have resistance at around 297 and a half. So even if there is a pop, you're gonna face resistance. So the best case scenario for the bulls is actually consolidation or even maybe a mini pullback, not a major one, meaning not all the way down to 285, but maybe all the way down to 292. But really the aim of the bulls is to hold ground right now. The gains, so far so good. Holding those gains is what the bulls are hoping for. And if the chart closes the week as is right now within this range above 290, I would consider that a win for the bulls. Here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Qs, the NASDAQ. Nothing changed really from a support slash resistance perspective because the support remains 11,689, the resistance at 12,207. A closing above that number will be a major major victory for the bulls now what if the chart closes below that no big deal so long as it closes above 11,689 if it closes below that a major victory for the bears because if that happens it will happen due to a disappointment from the employment report and it's really hard to fix that disappointment even after the cpi comes out next week and therefore a weekly closing that erases the majority of the gains for the week is a major victory for the bears. Here is the IWM 30 minutes chart for the Russell 2000. Yesterday we were talking about a bear flag pattern and perhaps the Russell 2000 underperforming the Qs and the SPY could be a leading indicator. I'm not a believer in that theory. Never believed that the IWM is a leading indicator of anything really. And as you can see the bear flag did not play out and the bears ate a big pie in the face. But perhaps the bulls are about to get a massive pie in the face too. Because what we have right now is a bullish formation, a bull flag formation. And the chart is trading above a very important resistance, now support of 174.22. The chart says, higher we go. The problem is, when you look at the momentum indicators from a 30 minutes perspective, they're getting overextended, meaning they're ripe for a pullback. What that really means is, even if the disappointment from the jobs number is not that big, the fact that the charts are technically overextended and ripe for a pullback could exaggerate the move to the downside, even if the fundamental reason behind that is not really so negative. Here's the Dixie, the dollar index, what's going on here. Even though the pound went higher today, the dollar continues to hold ground. This is a sign of strength, but again, at some point, it's going to become overbought. Are we at that point yet? Not yet, not quite. But the dollar is going to move higher or lower, once again, based on the employment report, we're about to get in the morning once again we'll talk at the end of the video but it was gold what's going on the pain continues the chart is getting technically oversold what does that mean it means it is ripe for a bounce but that bounce depends on a fundamental reason the fundamental reason is the employment report in the morning if it comes out favorable for gold to move higher we will see a big bounce perhaps it will take gold above 1763 once again what about crude brent four hours chart what's going on here the dip buyers indeed showed up today but are they really dip buyers or are they just shorts covering we'll find out in the next few days for now the chart's trading above 100 so far so good it is facing the resistance of around 105 84 but it is forming a bull flag pattern whether the bull flag is going to play out or not it all depends on the follow-up if we do have follow-up by dip buyers the chart is going to pop higher and if it does folks if crude indeed recovers and it trades above 110 once again forget about all the talk about 
peak inflation and the talk about the Fed maybe not having to be as hawkish as we thought, maybe the 75 basis points hikes will come down to 50, all of that will be out of the window if crude indeed recovers and trades above 110 once again. Here is the 10-year yield from a daily chart perspective. What's going on here? It is now facing the resistance at around 3%. And in the morning, it's going to be a really decisive moment for this chart. Again, if the report comes out favorable, this chart is going to blow up higher and it could reach and challenge the highs of 3.5% in a single day. But if the report comes out unfavorable, you will know what unfavorable means by the end of the video. We will see a flush down again all the way down to let's say 2.72, which is the support that I have for now, and then we'll take it from there. The TLT weekly chart, what's going on here? We have one day left for the week, but for now, the damage is evident because the chart erased the entirety of the gains for the week so far. We're not seeing any confirmation of the MACD indicator that shows us that the bearish momentum is over yet. How about the VIX for our chart? What's going on here? By looking at the MACD, we can see that the chart is under bearish momentum for now, but it is not pulling down dramatically. It is still inconclusive, even though the SPY bulls, the VIX bears, have a slight advantage, but Watch out here because while the 4 hours chart for now might not provide us with valuable information, the daily chart could. If we zoom out to the daily chart, what we can see is we have a defined trend line of support. We've seen reactions from this trend line over and over and over again. The assumption is we will see the same reaction which will produce a rebound in the VIX and a rebound in the VIX means a pullback in the SPY. This is the assumption for now. What about the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ, 4 hours chart? For now, the chart remains inconclusive, even though the NASDAQ bulls, the VXM bears, have a slight advantage. And we can see that advantage illustrated in the MACD indicators showing us red impressions on the histogram. But the chart for now did not really violate the support of 32.72. Until that happens, who's to say that we're not going to see a bounce, a rebound, we will see the VXN trading at 39.99, let's say 40, by tomorrow. It could happen, and that will come hand in hand with a massive pullback in the queues. What about Apple, a daily chart, what's going on here? The ABC pattern played out, it got the chart not only above the resistance of the gap, but also above 145, and it's now eyeing 150 as resistance. I would say closing above 145 for the week is is a major victory for Apple. If Apple goes up, the queues will follow through. Tesla, the souffle, 30 minutes, what's going on here? The bulls did indeed show up. They took the chart all the way above 700. This is a massive victory for the bulls. For now, the chart is forming a bull flag formation, but be careful here because the momentum indicators, the RSI, the MACD are getting a little overextended, at least from the 30 minutes chart perspective. What does that mean? The chart is ripe for a pullback in a disappointment from the jobs employment number and Tesla Tesla could pull back all the way down to 700 once again, erasing all of the gains from today. But what the bulls are aiming for, at least for now, is a weekly closing above 700. That would be a win in my book. If the bears can pull the chart down and close the week below 700, that would be a major victory for the bears. What about Bitcoin? Tulips, what's going on here? No update, despite the pop that we got today. And there is a reason for that. If we zoom out to a weekly chart, as you can see, the chart got way oversold, and hence the rebound so far. But you're not going to feel out of the woods as a crypto or Bitcoin investor until the chart closes above 26,555 from a weekly basis perspective. Now, what is the significance and the importance of that number exactly? The answer is, it is the top of a pullback candle. A closing above that, from a weekly chart perspective, confirms a reversal, not just from a candlestick perspective, but also from a momentum perspective. Lastly, here is your bonus chart, CROX, weekly chart, what's going on here? This is a chart that is pretty much done with the bearish momentum, and it is moving and transitioning from bearish momentum to bullish momentum. How do we know that? Look at the MACD indicator. We're seeing green impressions in the histogram for now. We have one day left for the week, but if Crocs closes with this indicator showing up a green impression, this is a confirmation that the negativity and the sell-off is over. We will have short covering, dip buying, perhaps a rally for a week or two in this name. And that rally could be big, by the way, if we have massive short covering. It could take us all the way to the next Fibonacci resistance at around 76 and a half. Uh, with that, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have in the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the most important non-farm payrolls, we have consumer credit, but it's really all about the payrolls. Now, we got a leading indicator 
better today in the unemployment claims for the week, which have risen higher to 235,000. This piece of news that we got in the morning perhaps was the fuel for the rally that we got in the equities market. Why? Why would the equities market rally on such bad news? Because this bad news indicating that we're seeing unemployment claims moving higher, and perhaps the confirmation coming tomorrow by a cooling down in the jobs market or even slight losses in jobs mean that the economy, from the jobs market perspective at least, is responding to the hawkish narrative and the tightening of the monetary policy by the Fed. And this is exactly what the stock market needs to see. It needs to see that the jobs market is cooling down. We're seeing some job losses, not a lot, as a result of the Fed's action so far, which means that the Fed doesn't have to be as aggressive as we previously thought. But if the report comes out hot again, perhaps showing over 100,000 jobs being created in the economy, or even more than that, if it comes out too hot, what does that mean? It means that the economy, the jobs market, is not responding to the Fed's tightening so far. And the Fed needs to be even more aggressive, and that scares the stock market. The stock market cares about the Fed. The stock market doesn't care about the underlying economy. It never did, at least since the quantitative easing era. So once again, bad news equals good news. Good news equals bad news. And now you know. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again over the weekend. Hey, what are you going to do? Nice college boy, eh? They want to get mixed up in a family business? Huh? Now you want to gun down a police captain one because he slapped you in the face a little bit? Huh? What do you think? This is the army where you shoot him a mile away? You gotta get them close like this, but a bing, you blow their brains all over your nice side of league suit. Come in. Look at the mask with my boy.